Lecture Series 1. I'm Brittany Crooks, and I'm the Academic Coordinator of the UBC Astronomy Club. And I am very pleased to introduce our first lecture of the year, Professor Jamie Matthews. He studies primarily uh, stellar astrophysics and astroseismology, and he's probably the best known for being the leader of the team for the MOST telescope, which is Canada's first space telescope. Great piece of trivia for you. And he's also probably the most well-known for being the best dressed person on campus, <laughs> consistently every day. So without further ado, Professor Matthews. Thank you. And uh, the most space telescope actually is a trivial pursuit question in the science and nature category in one of the editions. Well, it's great to be here. And uh, always happy to hang out with the UBC Astronomy Club and its members and its groupies. Uh, who hopefully will become members very quickly. So tonight, I'm not going to tell you much about the physical nature of the moon. You know, it's an airless, heavily cratered world. It's of, of great scientific interest because it is a record. Those craters, those scars are a, a record of the impacts that took place over the last, you know, roughly four and a half billion years in the vicinity of the Earth. And they haven't been wiped clear by erosion and uh, volcanism and plate tectonics as they have been largely on our own planet. Uh, it is a world, but it's a small one. And here is a snapshot taken by the Galileo probe when it was en route to Jupiter. It swung past uh, uh, the Earth for a little bit of a gravitational boost. And it captured this view of the Earth and the Moon from about 6 million kilometers away. And that's a pretty good perspective of the two. And you can tell the sun is uh, uh, directly to the right, illuminating both. The moon is in quarter phase, uh, uh, first quarter. And the Earth is in first quarter phase, if you were uh, living at that perspective at the time. Now, the moon has been inspiring throughout the history of humanity. And I was inspired by the moon. But I was inspired more, I think, by dreams of the stars and deep space and traveling to the stars. And uh, I grew up for the original classic Star Trek series. And so I, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I would love to be on board a starship. That's the dream. This is the reality today. Travel to the International Space Station. And for the last 45 years, no human beings have gone any further than this, which is about 400 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. So that doesn't feel like going boldly where no one has gone before. In fact, when you think about it, 400 kilometers is the distance to Kelowna from here. Uh, it's just straight up. Uh, let's think about a trip that's a little further out. The moon, our nearest neighboring body in the solar system, in the universe. And here, the Earth and moon are shown to scale. And you can see that was about right when you saw the Earth and Moon in that Galileo picture. The Moon was behind the Earth along the line of sight. Here they would be side to side. And this is, while it's a short hop in an astronomical sense, in a human travel sense, it's a pretty intimidating voyage, uh, almost 400,000 kilometers away. But not so intimidating that people didn't try uh, to get there. In fact, they raced to get there. And uh, to give you a quick synopsis of the history of that race, I'd like to show you uh, what I call a space music video, one of 30 that I and my colleagues at Two Story Productions have produced for the Knowledge Network to run between programs. There was Space Week 1, Space Week 2, and what I'm going to show you is from Space Week 3, which just I uh, started airing about a month ago on Knowledge, and you can actually see it online on their website. Uh, the reason it's a sp space suite is because the music videos tend to have classical soundtracks. Uh, partly that's what the customer Knowledge wanted, and partly because it's a lot cheaper to get the rights to recordings of uh, uh, classical music. So here we go, uh, a very brief introduction to the race to the moon.
refused to go to the moon because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept and what we intend to win. So that, in a couple of minutes, is the story of the uh, first decade, essentially, the first uh, 12 years of space exploration, eight years, uh, uh, 13 years. So it was a race for humans to visit another world, even if it was a very airless, forbidding one. And the Apollo project from the Americans, from NASA, uh, won the race. Before I go on to talk about that, I might just uh, answer kind of a puzzle, is why were the moon missions named after Apollo, who was a, a sun god, the goddess of the moon was Artemis and Diana, Apollo was the god of light and the sun. Well, it turns out that the director of NASA's space flight operations, uh, Abe Silverstein, uh, recalls that he was flipping through a book in mythology one night, in early in 1960, and he thought the image of, quote, Apollo riding his chariot across the sun was appropriate to the grand scale of the program, unquote. So that's where that came from. If he'd picked up a, a different book, who knows what history would be uh, describing. So Apollo 11 was the one, uh, the, several Apollos went to the moon, but that was the first landing mission aboard a Saturn V rocket, which uh, was taller than the Statue of Liberty. And here's the launch with the mission patch in the foreground. There, uh, I haven't included the sound effects, but it's kind of <laughs> <laughs> One thing as you watch this, if you uh, remember watching uh, space shuttle launches, and I was there for the first launch of the space shuttle, what really surprised me was the space shuttle takes off uh, like a rocket, like a jackrabbit, whereas the Saturn V kind of rose very majestically uh, on the uh, flames of its five main boosters. And there they are. You can see them, the, the rocket laid on its side, one of the ones that wasn't used, if it's, a, it's kind of like the used car lot for spacecraft uh, at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And you don't have to go that far. You can see part of the Saturn V rocket, one of the J-2 engines that uh, boosted its second and third stages uh, here at our H.R. McMillan Space Center uh, in uh, Vanier Park, the planetarium uh, here in Vancouver. The spacecraft that ferried human beings to orbit around the moon and eventually descend to the surface uh, were the command and service modules uh, and the, the, uh, the astronauts lived in the command module, the service module provided power, air, other uh, supplies, and then two of the three Apollo astronauts on a mission uh, if it was a landing mission, would descend to the surface in the lunar module, and the command module pilot would remain in lunar orbit. There are those spacecraft around to scale and showing the, you know, the three Apollo astronauts who would live in the command module and the two that would descend, two of those that would descend uh, to, you know, to the surface. I just want to emphasize that of all of this uh, uh, machinery, uh, those are the parts that were actually available for occupancy by the spacecraft. So very cramped quarters. Uh, and even more so when you consider that it was a three and a half day trip to the moon, three and a half days back, and then however long you spent uh, in lunar orbit and on the moon. And so those are very cramped quarters uh, uh, to be with uh, uh, two other colleagues, even if you liked them very much, uh, for more than a week 
on a voyage that uh, stretched across almost 400,000 kilometers. The lunar module, which was uh, originally called the Lunar Excursion Module, or the LEM, uh, you know, doesn't look aerodynamic because it didn't need to be. It was only exposed after the launch from a protective cowling, and uh, because the moon has no atmosphere, it needed no aerodynamic uh, design to descend to the lunar surface, and so that's why it looks uh, like a bug. And here is uh, video footage from the Apollo 11 landing. There is a soundtrack here. They, the astronauts weren't playing music uh, in the background. Somebody added this soundtrack later, uh, but keep that in mind because I'm going to uh, uh, add a different soundtrack a little bit later. It's all routine. It's like, it's like they're navigating their way to the supermarket. Now you see, you see the, the shadow of one of the landing struts. Now the shadow of the entire lunar module. The eagle was the name that they, they dubbed the lunar module on Apollo 11. So here is a kind of a, a sketch map of the, uh, the landing site where the lander came down. And to be honest, what you heard and what sounded so calm and routine was a near disaster. It turns out they were coming down originally on autopilot. They'd been released from the command service module. They'd undocked a little bit uh, later than uh, expected. And so the autopilot, the computer, was going to bring them down uh, into a crater filled with boulders. And the lander legs would have failed, could have crumpled, they might have lost uh, pressurization right there. So Neil Armstrong took over and piloted the lunar module uh, manually to a safe landing there. Uh, and so they were 19 seconds from disaster, from a very different story. That space music video that I showed you would have uh, had a much sadder ending, uh, or at least a, a, another uh, uh, catastrophe in the middle. And everything sounded routine in the, uh, in the video, the recording you heard. You hear co-pilot Buzz Aldrin calmly say 30 seconds. That was the point at which they had 30 seconds of fuel left. And they touched down 11 seconds after that with 19 seconds of fuel left. So here, if you were going to make a movie of the Apollo 11 story, nobody really has other than a documentary. There's a movie, Apollo 13, because Apollo 13 did have a catastrophe. Uh, but Apollo 11 was, uh, seemed like a success story, and it was. But here, if it were a movie, here's my soundtrack for that landing footage. Tranquility-based here, the eagle just peed his pants. 
So that was my version. The uh, Buzz Aldrin was played by a former astronomy grad student, uh, John Benjamin. And uh, you might have noticed, I think you were laughing at one laugh, but somebody after saying it would make a great movie, and, uh, and he, uh, Neil asked Buzz who would play him in the movie, and he says Burt Reynolds, and uh, that was just trying to be culturally, historically accurate uh, for the movie context. I mean, Burt Reynolds was a, a very popular TV and movie star in the late 60s, peaked in the 70s with the Smokey and the Bandit movies, and maybe with his first male centerfold in Cosmopolitan in April 72. Anyway, there was no disaster. They landed successfully, and Neil Armstrong made the first step on the moon on the 20th of July, 1969. He flubbed his line. I uh, was uh, planning to say one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind, but ended up saying one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, but that's kind of great. Remember, for most of the great historical moments in the history of our species, there haven't, hasn't been a live uh, you know, television audience to record it. So we don't really know what a lot of people said at those great moments. Uh, we only know what they say they said or what other people reported they said. So in this case, it's kind of nice to see the humanity of this. And by the way, I have to confess, this is not a picture of the first person stepping onto the moon. It's a picture of the second person stepping on the moon because the first person is holding the camera taking the picture. <laughs> Just in case we get into the lunar conspiracy theories a little too early. <laughs> They returned home safely, but uh, the one thing, I, rather than showing you the splashdown and so on, I want to show you the bureaucracy of coming home from the moon. All uh, Apollo astronauts had to fill out a U.S. <laughs> Customs and Immigration Declaration <laughs> when they returned to Earth. And for the part of the forum asking departure from, <laughs> moon. So there you go. Now the Apollo 11, 12, 14, 15, 16, and 17 astronauts all explored the surface. And here's an astronaut exploring the surface of the moon. Uh, it might not be too obvious. There's the astronaut in this panoramic shot of the moon. They collected rock samples to return to Earth to, uh, for analysis. And in fact, you can touch one of those rock samples here in Vancouver, also at the H.R. McMillan Space Center. We're one of the only five places on Earth where we have a moon rock on display which you can physically touch. Uh, reach underneath and touch with your fingers. It's kind of like a cosmic Blarney stone, uh, you know, kissing the Blarney stone. And uh, there I am posing with it. And so if you haven't been to the Space Center, the planetarium uh, lately or ever, go on out and uh, you can uh, touch a piece of the moon and you'll be one of a very small fraction of humanity that's can say they did that. You can have bragging rights. Uh, you can brag about it on Tinder or something. I don't know if that will <laughs> And astronauts also had fun on the moon. six Apollo landings in total. Apollo 13 never made it to the moon, uh, but the astronauts were returned safely to Earth. Spoiler if you haven't seen the movie Apollo 13. Uh, and there were also three Soviet Lunokhod robot probes which landed and returned to Earth with rock samples. There were many landers in the moon, but only the Soviets actually sent robot landers which returned with uh, small amounts of lunar samples. So that's the story. That's the history. In a, in a nutshell. But is it? 48 years ago, on Apollo 11, did astronauts actually land on the moon? Or was it actually a hoax by the US government, filmed in some secret studio, you know, Channel 51 in Arizona or New Mexico? This idea uh, was, you know, proposed long, you know, soon after the Apollo landings, mostly by 
if you'll forgive me, crazy old ladies in like Utah who thought that rockets were affecting the weather. And it kind of didn't gain a lot of traction uh, until much, much later when Fox ran a supposed documentary narrated by uh, uh, Mitch Pelletschi, who was on the X-Files, and it kind of revived the whole idea. But, uh, you know, not long, you know, only about uh, six years after the last moon landing, there was a Hollywood movie called Capricorn One, which basically told this conspiracy story, Henry, but now for a mission to Mars where NASA faked the first Mars landing and then later tried to kill the astronauts so that they couldn't blow the whistle. And the slogan for the movie was the tagline, uh, would you be shocked to find that the greatest moment of our recent history may not have happened at all. And, uh, and it's actually a pretty entertaining movie if you can ever find it or download it. Uh, uh, it's cheesy in parts, but it's entertainingly cheesy. And just to show you what era we're talking about, uh, O.J. Simpson starred in it as one of the three <laughs> Capricorn One astronauts. So people have looked at the footage and the uh, documentation from the Apollo missions and claimed to have found, you know, uh, defects, things that showed that it was faked, and so to expose the lunar landing hoax. And here is one of the most prominent ones. Where are the stars? in the skies over the moon. Here's a picture of the Apollo 11, one of the Apollo 17 astronauts on the moon with the flag. You've got these black skies, you know. NASA just didn't bother to invest in painting the backdrops. Where are the stars? There's no atmosphere in the moon, so there's no ray scattering. That's the process of scattering light off the molecules in the atmosphere, which scatters the light and gives us blue skies when the sun is above the horizon. But when there's no atmosphere, there is no scattering. So even when the sun is above the horizon, there is no bright sky. And so you should see the stars, even when it's daylight. And in all of Apollo photos, and in all Apollo videos, the sky is empty of stars. And this led me to think that maybe I've been fooled in other ways. And I started to uncover the great Paris nightlife hoax, that I had nightlife in Paris, which I thought was real. But here's a picture <laughs> of my, my former girlfriend, Aisha, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, who, an Egyptian Togolese princess, by the way, I'm not kidding about that, with the Eiffel Tower in the background. Where are the stars? It was a clear night. I remember seeing the stars when we walked along the Seine. Well, in every picture of people at night, <laughs> under clear dark skies, there are no stars because you're exposing to expose the things in the foreground, not the background sky. You can put the stars in the picture if you expose long enough, but then you overexpose the things in the foreground, and that's my friend Sebastian, uh, under, when we were in Costa Rica, uh, he's a, a, a physics science educator at the Exploratorium in uh, uh, San Francisco, one of the other five places, by the way, where you can touch a moon rock. Uh, and so, really, you shouldn't have seen any stars in the Apollo pictures. You're there to take pictures of the moon, not of the stars. Even though the moon is 400,000 kilometers from the Earth, that's a negligible distance compared to the nearest uh, you know, the, the nearest stars. We're talking about a factor of a million. And so the stars from the moon look pretty much the same as the stars from the Earth. So you don't go all that way just to take, you know, souvenir snapshots and selfies with the stars above the lunar surface. And if the Apollo photos had looked like this picture that I took under the uh, H.R. McMillan Space Center Planetarium Dome, then you would have known they were fake. That's what it looks like in movies. Uh, but that's not what it looks like if you're actually taking pictures. All right, okay, we'll give, them, we'll give NASA a pass on that one. But what about this? Here are two pictures taken on a, an Apollo landing mission. And in one of them, the lunar module is in the picture. The other, the lunar module isn't, and yet the backdrop is the same. So they were just moving around a big, like, you know, backdrop like they might do in Hollywood. 
Well, if you were taking a picture on Earth, here is, say, somebody posing in front of a, a conveniently set pair of trees. Uh, and, you know, the field of view of the camera is this dotted triangle. The picture will contain the person in the foreground and the tree is far behind and no real depth of field in this particular photo. But if you move the camera by only a little bit, by a meter or so, you can still keep the trees in the shot, but the person is nowhere to be seen. And this is just parallax. This is just perspective. The hills in this shot are far in the distance. Moving the camera by only a few tens of meters changes what you see in the foreground, but not at a distant horizon. We experience this in our everyday lives. When you're on a highway, everything right beside you is flashing by at high speed, but the mountains and the horizon are hardly moving at all. And if the moon happens to be off to, say, your, uh, your left or your right while you're driving at high speed, it'll appear to be chasing you uh, because it's so far away that even if you've moved uh, thousands of kilometers, you really haven't changed your perspective on the moon. And so uh, this is exactly what the pictures should uh, look like. <laughs> All right. I show, you saw in the, uh, the space uh, music video scenes of astronauts uh, planting the flag in the moon. And uh, people say they can see the flag waving in the wind where there's not any air, therefore no breezes. And this is the Apollo 14 flag racing. But the flag really only moves when handled by an astronaut and for a short time after that. And if you don't trust me, trust the Mythbusters <laughs> on Discovery Channel because they tested this. And let me show you what they found. This iconic footage replayed countless times across the globe. American astronauts planting the stars and stripes on man's newly conquered neighbor. To find out if it really was a PR stunt, Cary, Grant, and Tory have breached NASA's inner sanctum. Now, the conspiracy theorists think that they see some sort of breeze blowing around the flag, which you wouldn't have on the moon since there's no atmosphere. So I've built a replica of the lunar flag assembly. We're going to put it in a vacuum chamber, pump out all the air, and see if we can move it around just like the astronauts would have done placing it on the moon. See if we see that back and forth motion. All right, time the flag. The flag assembly is an exact replica of the one used on the Apollo missions. The horizontal rod specifically prevents the flag collapsing in a windless environment. Find out once and for all that the conspiracy theorists 
were for us. Where are we at? Well, we showed that a moon boot can make a footprint in lunar dust inside of a vacuum. So that one's busted. And momentum alone will keep the flag waving in a vacuum. You don't need any wind. So NASA 2, conspiracy theorists, zero. They also tested some of the other conspiracy theory observations and, uh, and also threw them out of the water. I should point out at, the, at this point, you know, I know that most of you do believe that, uh, that the Apollo astronauts went to the moon in the 60s and 70s, but I think all of us know somebody who doesn't. I, you know, I you know, friends and family, I certainly know others, and so this is more to give you some ammunition to try to convince others otherwise. Just a little more evidence from something called the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which was a, a moon orbiting probe sent to, by NASA in 2009, launched in 2009, and it took the highest resolution images of the lunar surface since the Apollo missions. And it passed above the Sea of Tranquility. Uh, and here's an image, it's covering essentially a kilometer by a kilometer uh, at high resolution. And let's uh, zoom in on this part of the picture because that part of the picture is the Apollo 11 landing site. And in that picture, you see the lander and the shadow that's, uh, that the sun is casting, uh, that the lander is casting due to the sun. And it's the part of the lander left behind. So the lander came down, it has a rocket engine, then the upper part which, in which the astronauts were uh, located had its own rocket and it uses the lower part as a launch pad and so the lower part of the lunar module stayed behind. Uh, and, uh, and there you can see it, and there's the, the kind of map that I showed you before of the landing site, including that crater filled with boulders that uh, would have been the disastrous uh, original landing site. So did astronauts actually land in the moon? Yes, they did. You can find uh, more arguments and different versions of what I just shared with you on Phil Plate, astronomer Philip Plate's a site uh, www.badastronomy.com. He's also a columnist for uh, uh, Discover uh, Magazine and for Slate. But while I'm answering controversial questions, now I want to answer the question, can an astronaut land a punch? Producer of a Fox TV documentary about the lunar landing hoax confronted Apollo astronaut Buzz Aldrin, second human being on the moon, at a shopping mall in Florida and accuses them of lying about walking on the moon. And here is what happened. You're the one who said you walked on the moon when you didn't. Call the kettle black, I've ever thought of saying, you for dinner if I went over me, you're a coward and a liar and a thief. <laughs> now, I'm not one to uh, to condone violence, uh, but in this case, I think Buzz Aldrin was justified in his reaction, and in fact, the judge thought so too, because this producer uh, brought uh, Aldrin to court for assault, and the judge decided uh, that uh, the response was justified. <laughs> I, uh, I should also point out that Aldrin was retired at the time and about 70 years old, so still in pretty good shape. <laughs> That's part of the human story of going to the moon. Let me share my own personal story. I didn't go to the moon, but I have a personal connection to the moon. Uh, and this is depicting the last trip to the moon, the, uh, the last launch of an Apollo mission, and the only one at night in December of 1972. And I was there when I was 14 years old. I was serving as a youth ambassador for Canada in something called the International Youth Science Tour, which was organized by NASA and the U.S. State Department to commemorate the final Apollo mission. And so I was there for the launch in the VIP grandstands, actually sitting beside the science advisor to the president and his family, and I'm still good friends uh, with his daughter, and uh, mission control in Houston during the moonwalks. And uh, years later, uh, as we were approaching the uh, 40th anniversary of the Apollo 11 uh, landing, I was being interviewed uh, by Pete McMartin of the Vancouver Sun and happened to tell the story that I'm going to share with you. And uh, that became 
the cover story of the Vancouver Sun that uh, weekend on the 18th of July before the 20th, uh, the date of the, uh, uh, where Neil Armstrong actually set boot on the moon. And so I kind of became known as the boy who touched the moon. And there I am, uh, age 14, at the Kennedy Space Center with the Saturn V rocket, five kilometers away. By the way, about the only time you're ever gonna uh, find a picture of me in a suit and tie. Uh, and as you avoid that. By the way, the reason why I and everybody else is five kilometers away, the closest you can be, uh, that's what in NASA ease is called the advanced, uh, the post-launch advanced fallback zone. Uh, and translating that, that means that if the rocket blows up, that's as far as pieces will travel before they hit the ground. And so you build your control center and vehicle assembly building, your press and VIP grandstands just beyond that zone, because uh, you, uh, you don't want the disaster to be any worse. And so that's the closest that anybody uh, could be to witness that. In Houston, at the Johnson Space Flight Center, I and the 79 other uh, ambassadors were in mission control during uh, uh, parts of the moonwalks. By the way, I should point out that this was organized and the uh, countries in the UN were invited to send a youth representative between the ages of 17 and 21. And 80 countries accepted, including Canada, and we had an, a national competition in Canada. I was 13 years old, uh, I lied about my age, and I won the competition. <laughs> <laughs> and by the time they knew, it was too late to do anything about it, so I was 14 and everybody else was 17 to 21. Uh, but while we were in mission control, at the, uh, at the end of the last moonwalk, just before Commander Gene Cernan and his co-pilot, uh, uh, Harrison Jack Schmidt, the only scientist that ever went to the moon, a geologist, uh, they came up to the, in front of the camera and began to talk to us. And here's what they said. So what became known as the Goodwill Rock was brought back to Earth, split up into smaller pieces. They were mounted on plaques. They were placed into a lucite, lucite sphere, so you can't touch them like the one we have at the Space Center here in Vancouver. And when I was 15 years old, I presented my moon rock to the Governor General of Canada, Roland Missioner at the time, uh, at a ceremony in Ottawa. In exchange for that, and it went on display in the National Museum, in exchange for that, they generously gave me an autographed copy of the National Museum. <laughs> I got the Governor General and the U.S. Ambassador and all of the, you know, the Director of the Museum and all the highfalutin officials there to sign it. And then years later, uh, when I was hosting Gene Cernan here in Vancouver, uh, and he was on a book tour for his book, The Last Man on the Moon, which has been made into a documentary film, which is very good. Unfortunately, Gene passed away earlier this year. But I told him uh, the story uh, that I'm telling you and I got him to sign my copy of Birds of Canada, and basically he signed, I can't believe you gave away Apollo 7, 17 moon rock for birds. <laughs> <laughs> and it has a, 
continues uh, a story, English art photographer Annabelle Elgar included the book in her exhibit, which was nominated for the French Prix Elysee uh, in 2015 and was shown at the Museum de Elysee in Lausanne, France, in spring of 2015. And so she, she took a photograph of the, uh, of the book with its dog-eared uh, uh, cover and so on. And so now it's, it's part of art exhibits as well. So this is the moon rock which I presented to the Governor General at the ceremony in Ottawa. And after being on display in the National Museum in Ottawa, it went missing two years later. I was told, because I would keep phoning the museum as the annoying young astro -uber nerd that I was, checking on it, I was told it had been stolen while it was in a traveling exhibition in Edmonton. And there is a black market in moon rocks. The street value, by the way, for my rock uh, would be about $7 million US. Uh, we think diamonds are precious, but uh, there's a lot more diamonds than moon rocks on the earth. There's you know, several hundred kilos of moon rocks you know, in the entire world. So they are one of the rarest uh, stones. Uh, and strangely enough, one of the agencies responsible for recovering missing or stolen moon rocks is the US Customs Service, because they've been imported from outside of the United States uh, and the FBI. And there was a sting operation in which, uh, years later, I saw a report, uh, you know, and I saw a picture, and it looked like my rock, but it turned out to be uh, the plaque from the, uh, the youth ambassador uh, from the Dominican Republic, uh, <laughs> and it had been stolen and recovered. And turns out what happened, nobody knows what happened, but this is essentially the, uh, my version of what happened. We have top men working on it right now. Who? Top men. Substitute my rock for the Ark of the Covenant. It turns out that my rock was sitting in a secure warehouse in Elmer, Quebec. Um, and I found this out when I was doing research for a lecture on the moon and I wanted to share my, the story of uh, my connection to the moon. And I wanted a picture of the Goodwill rock back on Earth before it had been split up. And I was digging deeper and deeper into the web and then I found a picture of my rock in the plaque, somebody holding it in a, a picture with a digital date and time stamp, and the date and time stamp, the date was in the year 2000. And so then I found out that my rock had, had been found in this warehouse in Aylmer, Quebec, uh, that was uh, you know, held the collection of the Canada Museum of Nature. And no one knows how it got there. The media interest, however, in my boyhood story, uh, uh, leading up to the 40th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing meant that my moon rock finally went on public display in an Ottawa museum, but unfortunately only briefly. Uh, and in 2010, I was finally reunited with my rock <laughs> after all that time. And then, you know, you have the usual second thoughts. You know, they went to the moon and all I got was a rock, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> all right. So that's my, uh, my personal tale. In my subtitle for my talk tonight, it's called A Tale of Fake Hoaxes and Real Lunar Illusions. And I'd like to fa share with you a real fake hoax about the moon. And it's a story of satire and science, hoaxes and history. And it's a case maybe of you had to be there to understand it. And this apparently is a joke this is how uh, uh, Neil Armstrong, who was a very soft-spoken person, but according to uh, friends, he would be at parties and he would tell a joke involving the moon, and, and usually a bad joke, and nobody would laugh, and then he would say, oh, I guess you had to be there. Uh, <laughs> and that was the real joke. So 
What I want to do is share with you an example of uh, social satire, but I want to start with another historic example of social satire that was perpetrated upon the public by Jonathan Swift, maybe better known for Gulliver's Travels, but he once published a pamphlet called A Modest Proposal for Preventing the Children of Poor People from Being a Burden to Their Parents or Country. And uh, his satirical solution to help impoverished Irish people, they could sell their children as food for the rich. And uh, not everybody saw the satire in it and got very upset, but here's a, here is part of that proposal. I have been assured by a very knowing American that a young healthy child, well nursed, uh, is at a year old a delicious, nourishing, wholesome food, whether <laughs> stewed, roasted, baked, or boiled. So this was Swift's attempt to basically shame uh, the English government uh, into doing something responsible for the, the Irish famine and poverty. And so here's another example of somebody for different reasons who published something which was meant to be a social satire. Richard A. Locke, who lived from 1800 to 1871 and published his satirical article uh, series in 1835, Great Dis Astronomical Discoveries Lately Made by J. Herschel. Locke was born in England to a very rich family. He was expected to attend Oxford, Cambridge, manage the family business. But at a young age, he became uh, what was considered radically political, and his father disowned him. And he became a writer, and he found it difficult to find work because of his political views in England. And in 1831, he moved his family to America, where he started writing for a brand new newspaper, the New York Sun. And he wrote articles in the Sun about life in the moon as a satire. The reason he was doing this was because he was very disturbed at the unchecked influence of religion upon science at the time in his perception. This influence led to, in his words, an imaginative school of philosophy that substituted airy fancies pleasing to religion for hard fact. These theological and devotional approachments upon the religion, legitimate province of science were evident to him in the works of Thomas Dick, who he called the Christian philosopher, who had calculated the population of the solar system, and German astronomers who claimed to see signs of life on the moon. And so he wanted to draw attention to that. This was the 1835 version of fake news. He wanted people to think about what they were reading and to evaluate it and to try to verify it. And so he published this, he wrote this, and the, uh, the New York Sun published this article called Great Astronomical Discoveries Lately Made by J. Herschel. So who's J. Herschel? J. Herschel is Sir John Herschel, a real astronomer, born in 1792. John Frederick William Herschel, English mathematician, astronomer, chemist, inventor, did some botany, kind of a Renaissance man, father 12 children, so he, was, he had time for that, I don't know how. <laughs> Mathematician, astronomer, chemist, inventor, botanist, and a dozen children. His father was the astronomer royal, William Herschel, German-born uh, English astronomer royal who discovered the planet Uranus in 1781 with that telescope. And in that woodcut engraving, by the way, that's his uh, sister, uh, William Herschel's sister, Carolyn, uh, who was quite an accomplished astronomer in her own right and cataloged binary stars and made many advances uh, in science. Speaking of advances, John was responsible for naming moons of Uranus and Saturn, and he's the one who introduced the Julian Day system, the date system that we use to this day uh, for uh, timekeeping of observations on a standard scale, not the standard 12-month you know, calendar and gee, what month has how many days in it to try to figure out how much time has elapsed between uh, two sets of observations, even if they are uh, centuries apart. Herschel also had an important influence on in Charles Darwin through his book, Natural Philosophy. And when they met uh, in 1836 at the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa, and to the extent Herschel had speculated on the idea of natural selection a few months before meeting Darwin, and scholars believe that he may have stimulated the start of Darwin's lifelong work on the theory of evolution. And uh, he gave uh, Darwin, uh, he gave uh, Herschel 
a first edition, a signed first edition of The Origin of Species inscribed from the author. And he once said about Herschel, he never talked much, but every word he uttered was worth listening to. Uh, I'm hoping that's what I will hear from the reviews of this talk tonight. <laughs> Please just put that, you know, write that on the, the blogs. Now, Herschel had gone to South Africa in 1834 to establish his observatory, which saw first light in 1835. And this is, I think, why Locke was comfortable, because basically, uh, you know, Herschel was almost on the opposite side of the planet from uh, New York, the United States. And so he figured he can perpetrate this hoax using that real name and, and uh, nobody would be the wiser. Uh, and, but it, and so he wrote, Sir John, a noted astronomer and son of the Astronomer Royal, true so far, saw fantastic animals on the moon, eh, uh, including bison, goats, unicorns, bipedal tailless beavers, and man bats, Vespertilio Homo, who had built temples. There are also trees and oceans and beaches. These discoveries were made with an immense telescope of an entirely new principle, you're telling me. So here's, uh, here's what the surface of the moon looks like today and what it looked like four billion years ago. These are great astronomical discoveries made lately uh, by astronauts. Here's the surface of the moon in 1835, according to the There's the bipedal tailless beavers. There are the man bats. By the way, I, I, I was editing this for general audiences, but in the, uh, the article they are referred to as fornicating man bats. <laughs> and uh, I think you can see that some of them are in the foreplay <laughs> mode here. So there is another illustration of a man bat, Vespertilio Homo, and maybe the uh, origins of Batman, Dark Nightio versus Blaney. <laughs> So, Sir so John Herschel, careless beavers, man bats, fornicating or otherwise. John Herschel is real, man bats and tailless beavers on the moon, not. Herschel eventually learned about these, uh, the article. He was still in South Africa when he learned of the hoax by letter. He thought it was amusing originally. Too bad my real discoveries here won't be that exciting, he said. After a while, he got a little annoyed. I've been pestered from all quarters with that ridiculous hoax about the moon in English, French, Italian, and German. And in fact, there was even a translation into shorthand. Uh, and this story disseminated across not just the United States, but the world. It took on a life of its own. Now, that's how Herschel reacted to the hoax. How did Locke react to his own hoax? Well, he wasn't very pleased with the reception. Nobody recognized it as satire. It was basically an illustration of the thing that he had hoped to criticize and draw attention to. And, uh, you know, a large segment of the newspaper's readership just took it as given. Articles reprinted in other major American dailies, <coughs> distributed as pamphlets around the world. And Locke was angry about this, but he couldn't say anything, or he felt he couldn't say anything, because he'd written the articles under a pseudonym, and he feared the backlash that he had experienced in England for his political views. And so, he stayed quiet, and you know, eventually just common sense uh, won out. But uh, you can read uh, the whole story in detail in this book called The Sun and the Moon, where the sun is referring to the New York newspaper, uh, the New York Sun, written by Matthew Goodman uh, in 2008. And you can see more about that in a 2012 Canadian documentary called Lunacy. Uh, that had its world premiere at the Toronto International Film Festival in September, September 2012, and the TIFF is underway again uh, this year, and I'm in it too, so if you, uh, it's about people who's, who are either obsessed with or lives are influenced by the moon. All right, the last part of my subtitle is Real Lunar Illusions. And so I told you about me and the moon, and now I want to kind of make it more personal for you and the moon. So lunar phases, the moon goes through phases during the month, and it's that, those phases which inspired the earliest calendars uh, that we have and, and why we adopted things like months in our eventual calendar. But if you look closely at these real images of the moon at different phases, you'll also notice that the size seems to change. All these photos were taken with the same camera with the same angular scale. Now, why does the size of the moon change? 
Well, it's because the moon doesn't maintain a constant distance from Earth. It's in an elliptical orbit, in an, in an egg-shaped orbit, which is exaggerated here in the diagram I'm showing you, uh, which at its most distant point, known as the apogee, uh, it looks smallest in our sky, and at its greatest point, closest point, the perigee, uh, and uh, uh, it is, it looks the biggest. And so there is, again, with the same camera, taking photos of a uh, close to the third quarter moon at perigee and a first quarter moon at apogee. And so you can see the total difference. By the way, you know, how many of you have heard of a supermoon? Uh, yeah, there's been quite a few. The, uh, and the supermoon really pisses me off. I gotta, <laughs> Supermoon's a term that was introduced by an astrologer in the late 1970s, and which nobody paid attention to until it was picked up by somebody in the media a few years ago, and now everybody in the media has jumped on the bandwagon. And the idea of the supermoon is when there is a full moon, when the moon is at its uh, closest point in its orbit, or near the closest point in its orbit, so close to perigee. And yes, it's a bit bigger, and yes, it's a bit brighter, but you can see here, those are the extremes from smallest to largest, and I didn't put over there the average size, but essentially the moon looks about 7% bigger uh, when it's at its apogee than on average. And it's really hard to see by eye when you're looking at the moon without any reference points, the fact that it's 7% bigger and a little bit brighter. And, but that's what a supermoon is. Now if Clark Kent's secret powers were that he was 7% taller than the average human being and 7% stronger, I don't think anybody would be calling him super anything. And, and so like, everyone gets worked up about the super moon and, uh, and often it is when, it's, uh, when they're observing it, they're observing it low in the sky. And people think that they're seeing it look bigger because it's a super moon, but it does look bigger but not because it's a supermoon, not because of the position of the moon in its orbit and its distance from the Earth. And so is, is that why the moon looks so big when you see it low in the sky? No. And in fact, if you measure the angular diameter of the full moon, and I don't rep recommend this particular technique to do it, but um, <laughs> if you measure it when it's high in the sky, and then later on when it's setting close to the horizon, even the same night, you will find that it has exactly the same angular diameter. The zenith is our, point, is our term for the point directly overhead in the sky. And so nearly directly overhead, near the horizon, you can see some of the uh, clouds and the haze uh, that it's shining through in the horizon. Same angular size. So why does it look so big when you see it in the horizon? And it does. I'm not trying to say it doesn't. It looks big to me too. Uh, but it's not because it's any physically bigger. So why? It's a very good question. And we don't really have a definitive answer for that question, but there are theories. And the best theory combines two things. Our, the brain's perception of the moon, when it's in your field of view with things that you're more familiar with, like you know, behind trees, buildings, mountains, things that you know, and your brain is kind of trying to draw the moon, which is far outside of our general realm of human experience and scale, tries to bring it into that world and somehow makes it look a little bigger to you. And also an effect called ocular motor micropsia, which is an illusion of changing visual angle that's caused uh, by the activity in your eyes muscles when they change focus like switching from a wide field to concentrating in a smaller angular area, like admiring uh, a full moon uh, when, it's, when it's rising. This is one of the things that helps to lead to headaches if you're watching a badly designed 3D movie when it changes perspective <coughs> and goes from like a distant shot to something uh, close up and your eyes try to adapt to that and, uh, and you can, you know, a percentage of people get headaches. People like James Cameron, Jim Cameron with the uh, Avatar, uh, movies. He knows how to do it right. He, he didn't try to maintain the right kind of 3D, the correct 3D perspective for every shot and every transition. He made the transitions so that they were more comfortable even if it wasn't quite the realistic 3D per, uh, perspective. So I'm not sure what causes the illusion, but how can you convince yourself 
and how did I convince myself that it's an illusion? Because I'm a scientist, I've got to test things out, just uh, so I don't trust you, uh, you know, to trust me necessarily, that I tell you that, I want you to verify it through your own experience, that's a scientific method. So the next time you see the moon low in the horizon and it looks so big, turn around and look at it upside down through your lens. And I guarantee it will look smaller than it did before. Now, oh, sorry. <laughs> By looking at the horizon and the moon upside down, you're briefly disorienting your brain and you disrupt whatever is causing the moon illusion and the moon looks uh, more at a more realistic angular size. Now, if you're performing this experiment, I recommend you do it when there's no one around with a camera, uh, cell phone, uh, especially if you're doing it naked, if you choose to go around doing naked and uh, you don't want to upset the meerkats. And on that note, I uh, will draw things to a conclusion. These are little excerpts from various television interviews I've done uh, by Skype and in studios uh, and uh, their backstory. The, the ones at the upper left and lower right, I'm not in a discotheque, I'm in a, a hotel room in, in the Vienna, I believe in both cases, but I have a portable laser light show that I often <laughs> <laughs> News anchors really liked it, so I use it a lot. <laughs> the lower, the lower left, I'm doing something for Turkish television, uh, you know, live where there was some uh, story about maybe information being able to escape from a black hole across the event horizon, and I'm demonstrating the quality of the information that escaped by taking a uh, uh, front page of a Vancouver Sun uh, and uh, tearing it up into little bits and crumpling it and then putting it into a container of what's supposed to be acid uh, to dissolve the pieces of the crumpled paper uh, and then that would represent the amount of information from the newspaper uh, that would survive escaping from the black hole. Um, in the center, I'm talking about the ha hazard of a satellite uh, uh, falling uh, from orbit and being hit and throwing a rocket to, and then uh, the global national anchor Newman. And at the upper top is for CBC when I was in Vienna when the, uh, the Rosetta mission, the Philae lander, touched down, actually bounced on the comet, and the producer got the time zones wrong. I was expecting to go on air live uh, by Skype at 10 p.m. Uh, and at 8 p.m. I was sitting in my room in front of my computer eating some noodles and gyoza, completely, <laughs> completely naked. <laughs> and my webcam comes on uh, from the CBC studio and we're going live in one minute and so I kind of just ducked below, went to the, uh, my garderobe, put on a t-shirt, a uh, t-shirt that I'm wearing there, but that's the only uh, you know, thing I'm wearing in that interview. I, <laughs> so, and I, and I used the, one of the Giosa as a demonstration to represent the comet. Uh, <laughs> so if you've ever wondered what's like underneath the anchor desk on these news reports, well, continue to wonder. Uh, <laughs> I apologize, I realize I'm wearing the same shirt in Vienna in these two, uh, two shots, but I do have a, a, a wide variety. As in my introduction, I'm noteworthy for my, uh, my wardrobe, so that's just coincidence. That I, and in the second case for the CBC interview, it was just a sort of a desperation lunging for a, for a shirt, so I got there. Um, anyway, I think I've taken up more than... Uh, my allotted time, so I'd like to thank you for your patience and goodwill, and if there are questions...
the meaning of the banana. Uh, it's, it's, it's just bling, but it is a... Uh, <laughs> harmonica. It, it started out with uh, uh, you know, a number of competitions. There was an essay writing uh, competition on the importance of space exploration to humanity. Uh, there were a number of, uh, of tests uh, that were sent, and then eventually uh, there were uh, things in which you went to Ottawa, and by that time it was too late for them to, uh, to change and when they realized how, how young they were. Uh, why didn't the Russians ever go up? They, they almost did. This is part of the, the story that people don't know. That it was a race, and the Russians, the Soviets, there was no value in being second place for them. And they had a program uh, with uh, rockets that were as powerful, actually more powerful than the Saturn V, that were called N1 uh, rockets. And they were very close. Uh, to having gone, but as soon as the Americans succeeded, they just gave up. They decided there wasn't any point in going on. Ironically, many, many years later, decades later, the engines on the N1 for the N1 rockets were bought by uh, um, uh, Blue Origins, one of the American aerospace companies, to use on their ships to uh, resupply the International Space Station. So they were, they were using like 40-year-old uh, technology, not just the design, the actual engines uh, that the, the Soviets had, had planned to use to boost their cosmonauts to the moon. So they had come very close, but they were very secretive about their program. And uh, after it was clear that they were second place, they refocused uh, their attention on an, a new priority, and that was a, a space station. And that's what led to the Mir. Uh, space station, the first real uh, space station. But uh, yeah, had the chips fallen differently, had Neil Armstrong not successfully taken over manual control on that Apollo 11 landing, then uh, maybe the Soviets would have actually run the, won the race. So it was that, that close to it. It's just the Americans were generally fairly open and public about their attempts and their failures, and the, uh, the Soviets were uh, much uh, less open about the attempts and failures uh, and more so in the, on the successes. But, uh, but no, they came, they came very close. And the Soviet and the Russian space program are an incredible uh, you know, accomplishments. Yeah? Where do you get your shoes? Uh, where do I get my shoes? Uh, various places. These are uh, Jeremy Scott Adidas. Uh, Jeremy Scott collaborated with Adidas for several years. And uh, I, used, I, was fr I am friends with the guy who uh, started up the Adidas in Western Canada, so I can get deals sometimes on them uh, and not pay full price. And when I, Jeremy Scott loves wings. He's got a lot of shoes with wings incorporated in the design. And when I travel by plane, I have to wear one of these Jeremy Scott's with wings because now I travel so much that the, the check-in and security staff at airports around the world know me. And if I'm, if I'm not wearing shoes with wings on them, they're disappointed. No matter how interesting the shoes are that I'm wearing. So I always have to make sure. I still need a plan to fly, but I need to wear winged shoes when I fly. Please do that. Okay. Yes. How about the dark side of the moon? Oh, how about the dark side? How about the dark side of the moon? So there is no, uh, with all due deference to Pink Floyd, and I love Pink Floyd, and it's a great album and a great album cover, but there is no permanent dark side of the moon. Uh, there is a permanent far side of the moon uh, with respect to the Earth. The moon has been locked uh, into a ballet with the Earth by the Earth's tides so that it always keeps one face to us and so that it spins on its axis in about the same amount of time as it takes to revolve around the Earth. And so from the Earth, we only see one half of the moon. And the other half facing away was never seen until uh, Soviet probes were the first to orbit the moon and so it's the far side. And the only human beings to see uh, the far side of the moon were the Apollo uh, astronauts after, from Apollo 8 
onward. Uh, and so, but, uh, so there is a far side, there is a dark side, but there's always just half of the moon is always dark. Uh, the, ha the half that's facing away from the sun, uh, that hemisphere is, is always black. It's like there's a dark side of the earth, uh, whatever side of the earth, hemisphere of the earth is facing away from the sun directly is night, essentially. Uh, and so in that sense, yes, there's a dark side of the moon, but it's not always the same uh, side of the moon. But still, it's a very poetic album title and song title. Yeah, sorry, so I, I want to ask, like, is any human so, uh, so, Mar, the question is, did any humans, did any of the Apollo astronauts go to the far side of the moon? No, because there was no way to communicate with Earth at that time. There had been a plan, if the Apollo missions had continued on uh, longer, to put satellites in orbit around the moon that would act as communication satellites, and then you could put uh, astronauts uh, or, you know, on the far side, blocked uh, from direct radio contact with the, with the Earth, but you could stay in communication. But the Apollo program was supposed to go on much longer, at least until Apollo 20 and afterwards, but human gains get really blasé about things, even if it's going to the moon. So by Apollo 15, the uh, American television networks were not interrupting daytime soap operas to show live footage from the surface of the moon. And basically, you know, the public, the taxpayers kind of got bored with the moon, and so the government got bored with the moon, and uh, they truncated the Apollo program at 17, and the next uh, main uh, effort for the American space program. For the Soviets, it was the space station. For the Americans, it was a space truck, which eventually became the space shuttle. Did you ever doubt about men landing in the moon? And why made you believe, if the answer is yes, why made you believe that they did? And if the answer is no, why? Okay. Well, I, I never doubted that uh, people had gone uh, to the moon. You know, I was there for the launch of the Saturn V, it's an impressive uh, thing to do later on in my life and in my career. One of the things that the Apollo astronauts did was they left behind special mirrors, retro reflectors on the moon. Uh, if, if you try to bounce a laser beam off the moon, uh, a laser is a very collimated beam of light, but uh, once it's traveled uh, 400,000 kilometers, the spot of a laser beam is about 20 kilometers across. And the moon is very dark and not very reflective. It only reflects about 11%. If you see the moon rock and you touch it at the Atrium Mountain Space Center, you'll be struck by the fact that it's almost black. It's almost as dark as charcoal. And that is typical of the moon. The moon is really dark, it just we don't notice it because it doesn't have anything to compete with. It's been generally just against a black, starry sky. And so it looks bright uh, by contrast. But if you saw it against a white piece of paper, it's, it's very dark gray. And so in order to bounce a laser off, a laser beams off the moon and get a signal back, a reflection back, the Apollo astronauts left these uh, laser reflectors. And the reason why we want to do that is because we know the speed of light to a very high uh, accuracy. And so if you, you bounce a laser off of the moon, the time it takes, the round trip time, you divide that by two and you know the distance to where the, that particular mirror is on the moon, and you can measure the distance to particular points on the moon to an accuracy of better than a centimeter uh, across a distance of 400,000 kilometers. And we have been able to measure that the moon is slowly spiraling away from us at a rate of about four centimeters per year, which is exactly what we predict by the tidal interaction, the gravitational interaction between the Earth and the moon, and which matches the changes in the Earth's rotation rate that we can infer from ancient observations of total solar eclipses, from the Babylonians to the Chinese to the Arabic astronomers and, uh, and so on. And, and so somebody went up there and left those things uh, up there. I have been involved in the analysis of uh, some of the moon rock samples, and they are not from Earth. They have many similarities to Earth rocks, but they have many distinctive isotopic ratios which are unlike anything on this, in this planet. Everything that I know, and, and if there's a conspiracy, it has to be a conspiracy that involves not just the United States, but scientists from around the world, like me. I have no uh, reason to support that. One of the, let me, let me give you two kind of more cultural or philosophical arguments to say that it really was done. For one, it was a race, and the Soviets lost. And if there was anybody on this planet who would want to prove 
that the Americans had faked the moon landing? It was the Soviets. But they accepted it. They, they knew that it had happened, uh, and they just gave up and moved on to other things. Another is an answer that was, uh, it's given in the credits of a great documentary called In the Shadow of the Moon. And it's, I think, the Apollo 10 commander, uh, Tom Stafford, says that if we were faking it, why would we ever do it nine times? Like, it's true. If you're pulling off a hoax and you get away with it once, then you give up, you know? Like, you just say, hey, we won, and now you find some excuse not to go back to the moon. But you do it again, and again, and again. And every time you do it, if you're faking it, you're taking the chance that somebody is going to find out that you're faking it. And so it really made no sense. If they were faking it, they would have been insane to have done it as often as they did it. Because every time, they were risking uh, you know, being discovered. And to be honest, you know, there, what I can tell you is that it, it was, would be easier, it would have been easier and less expensive to do it than to fake it. Because the, the technology just didn't exist to recreate those hundreds of hours of footage which match uh, a, a vacuum environment under one-sixth gravity. And in which you eventually, for the, the later Apollo missions, you had a, a, a lunar dune buggy. It's called the lunar rover which carried the astronomers over many kilometers across the, uh, uh, the lunar surface, and, so, and in continuous tracking shots. Uh, and so you would have needed a sound stage, in this case no sound, you know, a vacuum chamber that was like 10, 15 kilometers, 20 kilometers in extent. Uh, and one is, uh, you know, there's nothing that even approaches that that exists today. And then you would have had to somehow CGI uh, everything, not just slowing down things in motion, you would have to reproduce the, the actual arcs of the way that you kick up dust when you're walking under one-sixth gravity. Uh, and even today in movies like The Martian, you know, great movie, Matt Damon uh, on the surface of Mars has a gravity, a surface gravity about half, or, uh, you know, uh, about 40% of what we're experiencing now. But in that movie, you know, when things drop, they drop at the rate they do on the Earth because uh, it would have added, uh, I don't know, probably a billion dollars to the budget to be able to somehow make every motion on the surface of Mars shot on the surface of the Earth look like it was under 40% Earth gravity. And we can't even do it today, or at least we can't afford to do it today practically. Uh, and we're asking how we've done that almost 50 years ago. And, okay, maybe NASA, the U.S. government, had access to some technology, you know, that's basically, you know, but then why did they never ever use it on anything else? I mean, you're, you're sitting on computer-generated film technology, Hollywood makes billions of dollars on blockbuster films, and the U.S. government just sits on it for 50 years? I, none of it really hangs together in terms of, a, you know, in terms of, uh, of, of, of common sense. But, I can say that uh, you know, it just would have been an impossible to fake. Maybe they didn't do it, but I, if, they, if they didn't, I have no idea how they created all of this stuff and how they made these samples and how they've kept an entire community of, of scientists and engineers, and as you can tell by tonight, scientists are, like to talk uh, from keeping secrets. You know, governments are not really good at keeping secrets, as, as we know. And, and so they wouldn't have, you know, if, if there really were uh, problems, really, if this really was some kind of hoax, there would have been much more compelling evidence. And the point is, is right now there is no evidence. Everything that you read about on the web, everything you see that's an argument that says that it's, that it's fake is, is easily dismissed. Everything that I see, and I've examined all of the footage and so on, it is consistent with really being on the moon. Are there any Earth shots from the moon? Uh, are there any Earth shots from the moon? Yes, in fact, the, uh, the most iconic one was from Apollo 8 that was uh, in orbit around the Christmas season. And uh, they showed a uh, you know, video of the, the Earth and, and were you know, reading from Genesis, from the Bible, if I remember correctly. Uh, but the, uh, 
The still shot of that Earth above the barren lunar horizon became uh, really an iconic uh, uh, image of our planet. And uh, so yeah, there are the only kind of full images of the Earth that we have are either from uh, robotic probes which went out and looked back at the Earth, uh, but the only ones taken by pe people uh, are from the Apollo astronauts because the International Space Station, the space shuttle, all the other uh, spacecraft are too close to the Earth. You, you get to see the curvature of the Earth and it's an amazing view, but you don't get to see the full 360 uh, entire uh, globe in one, in one shot. And so they, uh, there are now satellites which monitor the Earth from a distance to give us that global perspective. For the Apollo missions, they look back to the Earth kind of wistfully and, and to take some of those nice pictures more for their kind of philosophical and cultural impact uh, rather than for any scientific uh, impact. And, and I think those images became basically the logo for the environmental movement. When you see the Earth as that blue marble against this black sky, you kind of suddenly realize, hey, it doesn't go on forever and ever. And uh, you know, our resources really are limited. And so I think that really became the first brand logo for the environmental movement, the first effective brand logo for the environmental movement. Mm -hmm. Pardon me? None from the surface of the moon. There is, I remember a few. The question is, are there any from the surface of the moon? I do remember, I think they managed to get a shot, uh, and I think it was a deliberately posed shot with one of the astronauts, the other, the one holding the cameras crouching down near the flag, and you've got the Earth uh, overhead in the background. But it, it's, it's, it's kind of the Apollo equivalent of a selfie, uh, just to get the Earth in there. Okay, well, there's pizza here, so I don't think I should uh, hold up. I can certainly answer questions one-on-one. -on -one. I can stick around for a while, but I'll turn it over to our uh, host to, uh, to tell you what happens next. How about another hand for Professor Matthews?